Well, good morning, Cameron. It is uh, February 18th. Very glad to be with you this morning. Uh, important Sunday, first Sunday of Lent for this year. So um, quite a time and uh, certainly a time of reflection and a time to uh, think through uh, not only our sins, but the Lord's great sacrifice uh, on our behalf. So um, let's open this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we enter into this season of Lent, we give thanks for your grace and mercy. And we take count of our sin uh, with regret and looking for your redemption, which is made possible through the work and death and life of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray your forgiveness from our sins. Draw us close to you, O Lord. Open our hearts and minds to your word this morning. We ask all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All right. Um, our first reading uh, this morning comes from uh, Genesis 9, 8 through 17. And so uh, we'll turn to there. Genesis 9, 8 through 17. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you, with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And it shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Um, it's kind of a, a conclusion of Noah on the ark and God giving the sign of the rainbow. Um, a nice promise that certainly he's kept all these years, despite there certainly has been, uh, you know, flooding in certain locations. Uh, I think it's interesting that God says, me and you, me and every living creature. Of course, growing up, I was taught that proper grammar would be uh, you and me, but that, that to put me last. But God rightly uh, makes the motion that he comes first. God comes first before humanity, before all the living creatures. So I, I might say you and me, but God rightly says me and you. Uh, and I, I think that's at least uh, worth pointing out. Um, our second reading from 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 through 22, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, 
but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And so kind of that idea that the water renewed the earth and gave humanity a new start, um, we see that uh, in baptism, right? That the flood in some ways acts almost like a prefigurement of baptism. Our gospel reading this morning from Mark chapter 1, 9 through 15. Um, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending on him like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. Now, after John was in, was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So we step back to um, the baptism of the Lord this morning, uh, which I know we read recently in the lectionary, but this is, of course, we're starting the season of Lent. And I think this is a wonderful and beautiful passage where we have sort of all three persons of the Trinity um, sort of represented here, right? You've got um, the Son uh, being baptized, you have the Spirit descending like a dove, and you have a voice of the Father proclaiming Christ to be his Son. That's a wonderful uh, thing. And, and there would be good Trinitarian questions about uh, they're not separate. Because, of course, Christ himself is the word of God. So even in that moment when the Father wants to speak, uh, the second person of the Trinity is also involved in that process as the word of God. So, uh, and then, of course, well, what does that mean? Well, uh, you know, Calvin, I think, said that the divinity of Christ is not exhausted by Christ's humanity, that the second person is not necessarily um, uh, strictly confined. So... There's a lot of great mysteries, Trinitarian mysteries that are still present, even in this passage that, that we can't fully unpack or understand. And I, I actually take comfort in that uh, because God and the Holy Trinity is so beautiful and mysterious and powerful uh, that he exceeds my level of comprehension, uh, which is good, which is good because if I could just figure God out, I don't know that he would be a God worth worshiping, but he's far bigger than my meager capacities of understanding. Um, I always think it's important to look down at the end of this in verses 14 and 15. So Jesus went out into the wilderness. Mark's very succinct in this. We don't get the story about being tempted, um, just that he was tempted by Satan and he was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered to him. And now, uh, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And that message is what we just said on Wednesday as we applied the ashes to the foreheads. Repent and believe in the gospel. And, and Jesus sort of says, you know, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, he does this. <clears throat> in his, this is his response to John being put up in prison. And so Jesus goes back up to Galilee and begins preaching. Um. I have often made the comment that, you know, this seems to me uh, a very strange response to John being arrested. Uh, John is his second cousin. Um, they are 
close in age. John, Jesus and John knew each other, obviously. Um, John had just baptized him. And they had kind of, we think, you know, known each other and had a close spiritual connection since before either of them were born. And so what, what should we say about this? Um, why didn't Jesus go over and get John out of prison? Um, because I would have wanted to. I have uh, a second cousin, as it happens, who is my closest cousin, my cousin Jake. And, you know, if Jake uh, fell into a difficult situation or he was arrested or something, um, if I had the power to get him out, I would want to get him out. Uh, but Jesus and John both were committed to something that they understood to be greater than their own lives. And that is the mission of salvation. And that they both saw that as more important than their human lives. So when John is uh, arrested, and we know he won't get out of prison, he'll die there. Um, <clears throat> Jesus does not stop and have a conflict with Herod and try to get John out of prison. Jesus goes to Galilee and continues the mission uh, to which he and John are both committed. This is the mission for which, not only for which they were born, for which they have been prophesied, both of them have been prophesied to come and, and for this purpose. So, I mean, you know, John understands that too. And so in a sense, um, Jesus honors John not by being distracted from the mission, but by doubling down and continuing the mission. And that idea of understanding his duty, and that's greater than human loss, uh, is actually a good lesson for us as Christians. I think... I think many of us struggle. I see this struggle in all of us and myself too. It's easy for me to be a Christian as long as life is kind of going along smoothly as planned. Okay? It's easy to be a Christian as long as everything's sort of going normally. But when we have those moments where something bad happens, when we have those moments where uh, there's kind of a bit of an emergency situation or something out of the ordinary occurs, then that temptation to compromise one's morals and convictions because it's an emergency, as it were, um, that temptation can be very strong. I, I will say this. <clears throat> and this has been my experience as a Methodist pastor, and I'm sure other pastors would, would say this as well. Everybody in the church, the, the, the pastors and the, and the district superintendents and even the bishop, we all talk about the United Methodist Discipline, the Book of Discipline. Um, these are the rules, these are the laws, these are the, the regulations. Uh huh. Um, but what I have seen is uh, until there is an emergency, then very often the regulations of the discipline get set aside. And the district superintendents will say, and they, they will say this, well, the district superintendents have the authority to interpret the discipline. And there have been some interpretations that are just flatly 180 degrees from what the discipline intends. And I've seen this since very early in my career, that when push comes shove, uh, the, the, the authorities will set the discipline aside as they see fit. And it's very disturbing because uh, that's not what's supposed to happen. In fact, when things get tough and there's a problem, that's when one is supposed to go to the discipline and adhere to it to guide us through times of difficulty. The same is with our faith. The faith and the scriptures are not a guide 
just for when life is easy and things are going good and everything's okay. The faith and the scriptures are supposed to be the guide to help us to negotiate those times in life when things aren't normal. In fact, when things are difficult, when we are facing hardship, that's when we're supposed to really rely on the faith even more and let it guide us through um, difficult times. Uh, if, if times are tough and things are difficult, I'm not, well, I'm, I don't have time to pray now. No, that's when I need to pray more. Um, when difficulties arise and I have problems, even very serious problems, loss of a job or the death in a family or what, you know, a terrible divorce, whatever it may be. This is when I need the scriptures and God's guidance even more. Uh, it's consistency and faithfulness amidst turmoil and hardship. That's what the faith is for. It's a little like Noah's Ark. Um, uh, when things were easy and good before the flood, well, the ark didn't even hardly make sense. Why do you need this ark? It's when things were bad, he needed that ark and he needed the Lord's salvation. So he certainly hoped he had done a good job when times were easy and built that ark watertight because when things got tough and he was doing what the Lord commanded him to do, he sure needed it to hold up in those circumstances. Um, I think you get the point. So Lent is a time when we need to reflect and repent of those moments in our life <clears throat> when we um, did not stick to our faith. We need to repent of those times when we were tempted, even with good reason, to step away from the faith and do what we thought was the worldly answer. Um, and we need to stop and refocus and draw close to Christ and prepare our hearts for the cross. And we need to remember who we belong to. And we need to remember where our loyalty is supposed to be. Now, oftentimes I talk about, and scripture does, the kingdom of heaven versus the world, or the kingdom of God versus the world. Jesus draws that distinction very clearly. Paul will draw that distinction very clearly. Uh, scripture throughout it, draws the distinction between this is how the people of God are supposed to live and this is how the world, the rest of the world lives. And they, and they mark those lines clearly. Um, and I'm glad they do. What I find in my own life, uh, especially as I've gotten older, is that often um, the line between the people of God and the kingdom of God and the world can become somewhat muddled. It can be uh, difficult as we live in the world and as we're trying to negotiate life in the world, as we um, live in the world, but are not supposed to be of the world, to figure out where that line is and to not let the world dilute or muddy the waters uh, or misdirect the people of God and blur what it means to live in the kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for this good coffee. I think it becomes all the more important then to draw close to God through prayer, through the reading of scripture, and through attending the church and to surround oneself with other members of the people of God, uh, to be able to see those lines more clearly. That's an important thing. Jesus draw those, draws those lines clearly. Scripture draws those lines clearly. 
And so if those lines are becoming blurred, perhaps we have drifted too far from Jesus that we're no longer able to see the lines clearly. And so I would encourage you uh, during this season of Lent to renew your focus on Jesus and to grow in your relationship with him. And for a long time, hundreds if not thousand years, Christians have done that by giving something up for Lent. Um, I would encourage you in your Lenten discipline. Well, we love you. Hope to see you soon. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.